Good afternoon, everyone. We're about to start. My name is Jorge Duani. I'm the director of the Cuban Research Institute here at FIU. I'd like to welcome you all to today's lecture. And I'd also like to acknowledge the co-sponsorship of this event by FIU's Department of History and the Department of History Graduate Student Association that has prepared those snacks for you. Also, as usual, I'd like to thank Amy Correa, our public affairs manager at CRI, and Lenny Gomez for organizing and promoting the lecture, as well as Dr. Sherry Johnson from the History Department uh, for supporting us in this endeavor. Uh, I'd also like to mention uh, the presence of uh, uh, Madame Louise Leger. Uh, I don't see her right now in the audience, but uh, she's a, there you go. She's the Consul of France. Welcome to our event. And before we continue, let me take this opportunity also to announce an upcoming lecture that may be of interest to you. Uh, the flyer is actually uh, at the entrance uh, to, the, to, the, to the meeting, uh, and the topic will be the Spanish community in Cuba from 1900 to 1940. It will be discussed by the renowned Spanish historian Consuelo Naranjo Orobio next Wednesday, September 25, at 11 o'clock in the same uh, room. So it's a very a great pleasure to introduce you to my good friend and colleague, Dr. Luis Martinez Fernandez. He's a professor of history at the University of Central Florida. Uh, where he formerly directed the Latin American, Caribbean, and Latino Studies program. He's also a trustee of the college board, uh, earned his PhD in history at Duke University, and his MA and BA in history at the University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras. Because he was born in Cuba and raised in Peru and Puerto Rico, he's something of a Cuba Rican like myself. And I would like also to mention one of the pioneering Cuba Ricans in the audience, Don Cristobal Diaz Ayala and his wife who are here with us as well. Dr. Martinez Fernandez's primary fields of study are the history of the Hispanic Caribbean, particularly Cuba and Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic, as well as Hispanics and Latinos in the United States. He has published several books, <clears throat> including, I'll just mention three of them, Frontiers, Plantations, and Walled Cities, Essays on Society, Culture, and Politics in the Caribbean, published in 2010, Protestantism and Political Conflict in, 19th century, in the 19th Century Hispanic Caribbean, 2002, and Fighting Slavery in the Caribbean, The Life and, and Times of a British Family in 19th Century Havana, published in 1998. He also served as senior editor of the a tremendous um, a two volume Encyclopedia of Cuba, People, History, and Culture, published in 2003, and has been a member of the flagship journal in the area of Cuban studies uh, with the same title. His most recent work is a comprehensive interpretive history of the Cuban Revolution which is scheduled to be published by the University of Press of Florida next year, and it's today the topic of today's lecture. So please help me welcome Dr. Martinez Fernandez. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for this invitation, Jorge, Sherry, and all of the others that have something to do in the preparation of this event. It's, it's been wonderful the way I've been treated. Every detail has been taken care of, and I'm, I'm happy to be here. I see many friends, and I brought some of my own family from, from Central Florida. My dear old friend, my dear friend, Cristobal Diaz Ayala, came all the way from Puerto Rico, sort of, <laughs> for this presentation. And I'm delighted to be here to talk about something that I really enjoy. Um, as you know, there are 11 million Cubans on the island. There are, or you must have the exact number, between two and three million Cubans outside of the island. There are maybe 500,000, to use a newer term, in some sort, in some stage of transnationality. They're not really sure where they are, we're not really sure where they are either. Which makes it about 13.5 or 13, or 14.5 million Cubans, and that's a problem, because all of them are historians. And uh, when you take their, jump into the, the risk of writing a, a general history of the Cuban Revolution, something that, as you know, is very controversial. And for me, the, the, this was really a mission, and I'll be very honest with you, as I like to be in my speaking and writing, um, I spent about five or six years trying to read almost everything that is out there on this subject. And as Fray Bartolomé de las Casas used to say at the time of the conquest, I didn't know whether to cry or to laugh. Because some of the, I don't think there's a better word for what I'm about to say in English, but tantas barbaridades. You know, so many outrageous statements. 
about Cuba, our history, our people. Um, I don't want to dwell on that, but I'll just mention one of them, which appeared in, in one of the histories of, a, of, of the Cuban Revolution, which is published and it's out there, uh, in which the author, and I said this in writing in a, in a book review, uh, the author said, and I'm paraphrasing very closely, that the Cuban exiles left the island because they lost access to exclusive clubs, private elite schools for their children, and fancy restaurants. And, and that's the kind of thing that I'm sure some of you have heard. And um, I don't need to say that I, I will bring a, a critical perspective. And I believe it's a, it's a mutual opportunity, critical perspective. Many years ago, I forget his name, somebody wrote Motivos y Culpables of what transpired in Cuba. And indeed, there are many, many guilty uh, parties. It's, 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 it's a very complex process. Um, it's something that really fascinates the world, how this little island so close to the United States managed to have a revolution, as uh, Fidel Castro said in the very nose of the, under the very nose of the United States, and that, that revolution is still going. So this is a very complicated phenomenon. Again, lots of people have written about it. Um, there are so many experts on Cuba. It's, it's, it's really a challenge when, when you people like Jorge and I spend our lifetimes researching Cuba, and the average person uh, claims to know better because they visited Cuba you know, for a week and, and they were taken in some tour. So for me, writing this book, which is now finished, actually I was uh, having a conversation with the editor and we were trying to figure out the title, which is one of the last things that you figure out. And of course it's not out. So this is not the, a birthday or a launching of the book, but maybe, and I see some food back there, it's, we'll call it the, the baby shower of the book, which will be born uh, hopefully in April when spring comes. Okay. This is a book that covers the entire sweep of the Cuban Revolution. And I begin with um, the coup d'etat in 1952 by Batista and the almost immediate reaction of rebels, of all rebels and people who just wanted a return to democracy, um, which were almost immediate reactions to that coup. And then it goes all the way to today, actually. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very different experience. I am a historian of the 19th century, and when you write about the 19th century, well, for one, nobody's going to stand up and say, hey, you know, that's not how it happened. I saw how it happened. Well, they're all dead. But when you're writing about such a contemporary topic, uh, everything changes, and you have to be very attentive to the last changes, and I want to share something with you, and I'll, it's the section from, from the manuscript that I will read. When I came here in April, uh, when Joanny Sanchez spoke, that experience forced me to rethink the ending of the book, and I was able to add a, a last section which is in, in, the, in the last chapter, which is entitled, A Blog Heard Around the World. And of course, uh, Jorge Duani, CRI, the University, uh, Florida International University, were critical in this process of having Ioanni Sanchez speak. Okay. Um, I like to play with visuals. And I find them, as a, as a professor, that they're very, very helpful because they, are, they can be inspiring. And here I try to play with, with mixing art. Some of you may recognize those, those paintings of, of course, Wilfredo Lam's La, La Jungla, and then on top, one of the very famous photographs of the revolution. So I'm trying to play with, with two themes there. Then on the other hand, we have one of the urban scenes by Porto Carrero and uh, an urban scene in, in Cuba today. So I, I try to play throughout this book with visuals. And one of the things that I would like to highlight is that I wrote the book that I wanted to write, and I'm very happy about that. It was not an easy book to find a, a publishing house precisely because of that. And I wanted to retain a Cuban voice, which to me was very important. And uh, 
for good or for bad, that's the way it is. And, and Cubans write and think differently. I mean, there's a Cuban literature is characterized by, by so many specific uh, manifestations. I mean, one of them is humor. The, the extreme of that, is, is, as you know, is choteo. I mean, can you get away with that? Uh, I think you can. I think you can hide some of that choteo between the lines. So, so this is the book that I published. Now, there were some things that I wanted to also accomplish. Number one, it has to be a scholarly book. Number two, because it is meant for a broad audience, but it's also meant for scholars, and I'm a scholar. So it had to be a scholarly. Number two, it had to be balanced. And when you're balanced and you're trying to uh, present the reality uh, with fairness, that's also risky. And I always tell my students that it's very easy and actually very comfortable to stand at one extreme. Because if you're on this extreme, your back is covered. If you're on the other extreme, your back is covered. But it's when you're in the middle that all of the, the firing happens. And again, I took that challenge, but I wanted to present something new and different. Uh, the third point in terms of um, the background of this book, this book is independent. And, uh, and that means that I did not write this book seeking you know, any special recognition, seeking any advancement in my career, I know of some of my colleagues who don't dare criticize Cuba because they go to Cuba back and forth, and when they criticize Cuba in a book, that closes the doors. Um, there's a lot of that, and I wanted to be fully independent and to write the book, of course, without his talent, that uh, Jose Martí would have liked to read. Okay. What I'm going to present is a skeleton of the book. And skeletons are not pretty, um, but maybe when we have time for, for questions and answers, we can put some, some, some meat in there. And the skeleton is, uh, I've entitled, seven, it's, well, seven Threads in the Labyrinth of the Cuban Revolution. And it's a metaphor for me trying to make sense out of this complicated phenomenon over 55 years, so many countries involved, so many changes, the two Castro brothers in power for so long. And I wanted to make sense out of this voluminous amount of information that I had found and how to organize it. And that's the best that I could come up with, the, the metaphor of seven threads. The first one, the persistent plantation. Cuba is a sugar island, has been a sugar island. It may no longer produce as much sugar but it is still a sugar island, and I'm going to expand a little bit on that. It was the very first crop of, of major importance in, in Cuba's history in the 1500s, and I have to be careful because there's an expert on early colonial Cuba here. Um, actually, it began in the early 1600s, uh, so that was not quite accurate. Um, and how sugar shaped society, and how sugar shaped culture, that's very important. The next one is an island on horseback, and that's a metaphor that I found in a poem by Belkis Kusamale, and I think it's a great metaphor for Cuba and its history. Cuba is an island on horseback, which means that there is a, a, a culture that venerates um, men and women in uniform, that venerates the caudillo. That is part of the historical DNA of Cubans of Cuba. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't get rid of it, because many other countries have, but it is one of the threads that runs through this book. Uh, the next one is the Pendular Revolution, and, and of all the contributions that I'm enumerating here, this is the least uh, original, because many other scholars have seen the Cuban Revolution as a pendulum that moves in one direction and another, alternating from pragmatism to idealism, back to pragmatism, back to idealism. I think uh, the, the pendulum has stopped, and, I'll, uh, at, and I'll, I'll speak to that later. Uh, the revolution's third man. Again, what does it mean that, well, we know who the first man was, right? 
Fidel Castro buscó el número uno, and then Raúl Castro el número dos, which could be read in different ways, and then has the, the issue of el, el número tres, who's the third man, and what does that mean? Uh, Guevara was at the beginning, and now, now I'm not really sure who the third man is, if there's one, but there have been a number of them throughout Cuba's history, and I find that to be a window to understanding the course of the revolution. The next one is sort of related to it. I think that Fidel Castro has been a, I have to be careful with what adjectives I choose, well, let's say a cunning leader. I mean, he's, he's somebody who, who's a leader that can manipulate, who can triangulate, who can play good cop at some junctions, who can play bad cop at some junctions, and that is one of the, uh, again, threads that I think helps me make sense of this whole history. There are two more, the longest 90 miles, and this is a metaphor. This is a metaphor for the distance between Cuba and the United States. It's very short, but these are very long 90 miles. Um, a few years ago, a dear colleague of mine, Lou Perez, uh, wrote a fascinating book entitled On Becoming Cuban, and he highlighted how similar Cubans and North Americans were. And, uh, well, in terms of the material culture, you're in the 50s, for example, perhaps even still today, I agree. But as far as fundamental cultural values, I see a huge distance between these two countries, which can be understood as an inherited distance that we found for centuries between uh, England and Spain. It's pretty much the same, the same distance. And as you know, for centuries, those two countries were, were enemies. And then lastly, many Cubas. And I'm going to leave that one for the end. Uh, I think that Cuba has been divided. Uh, the Cuban people have been divided in more ways than one. Uh, we have been divided before 1959. We have been even more divided after 1959. The people who remained in Cuba are divided now, increasingly so. The people who have lived in places like Miami are also divided. But I begin to see, and that's when I'll allude to Giovanni Sanchez, I begin to see some rays of hope. And I'll share that at, at the closing. I'm having difficulties with the, with the plant. Okay. The persistent plantation. As I said, Cuba began very early on as a sugar society. And some of you, I'm sure, have heard of Fernando Ortiz, very famous scholar, anthropologist, who wrote a fascinating book back in, published back in 1940 entitled The Cuban Counterpoint. I love that book. It's a very stimulating book. It's not a perfect book. But in essence, what he says is that there are these two Cubas that coexist. On the one hand, the Cuba of sugar, and on the other hand, the Cuba of tobacco. And many years have elapsed, and many of the things that he wrote have been challenged and, and reformulated. But in essence, I think he was right. And what he says is that there's a world built around sugar. Sugar, in essence, represented everything that was bad about Cuban society and culture. Why? West, well, sugar requires some form of coerced labor. Nobody in his or her right mind would work on sugar if they had an option not to do so. Number two, it requires large plots of land. Number three, it, 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 it sort of creates a hierarchical society, a pyramid with a, an elite on top the landowners and the slave masters, and then the masses of those who work under uh, coerced conditions. And then he associated with, associated with dictatorship and a, all the evils in Cuban history, he associated with sugar. And I think it's a useful metaphor, which I follow. Uh, then, and, and this is an early ingenio, then we look at the ingenios of the 19th 
century when sugar peaked in Cuba. And sometimes I share this with my students that I myself cannot believe it that in the, around the year 1820, Cuba's per capita income, including the slaves, was higher than in the United States. And that's almost, it's, it's, it's hard for me to even say. Well, it had to do with the enormous wealth generated by sugar. And now we see, um, actually, this is a contemporary plantation. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later, because back in 2002, Fidel Castro gave a speech in which he said, well, after being the master planter, which is another metaphor that I use in this book, after being the master planter for so long, in the year 2002, he said, we're not going to have sugar anymore. Sugar becomes to the, belongs to the time of slavery, which is a very interesting way, way of putting it. Well, sugar is no longer as important in the economy, but I contend that some of those uh, elements that I described, the coercion of labor, dictatorship, hierarchy, uh, large plots of land that are held uh, in single units, all of those, I believe, are legacies of the plantation. And you know what? You can run a hotel as you were a planter because it has more to do with attitudes and values and ideas about hierarchies and so on. Um, persistent plantation. Next one. Well, I think that picture says, says a lot. The same technology used, although some of the sugar production in Cuba, of course, the harvesting is mechanized, but it's still brutalizing work. You'd rather do something else rather than be there with a machine. Now, what's interesting, I think, is that sugar is a virus, I believe. A virus that infected the Caribbean beginning in Barbados. And all of those negative characteristics started there. And it continued to move from island to island to island to island, Cuba. And guess what? We don't have to go too far to see that virus. Here in Florida, we have plantations which have precisely the same kinds of results as we speak. Coerced labor, exploited labor, the degradation of the environment. Oh, one that I forgot. Cozy relationship between sugar producers and the state. Because sugar is so vulnerable that you need to have the support of the state. Well, it's been like that since the early 1600s when the king of Spain said, we're going to protect you, and if you go bankrupt, we're going to bail you out. It's still happening today. Sugar requires that protection. And when you have that cozy relationship, that leads to corruption which is the topic of another talk. Uh, an island on horseback. I love using these two pictures. Um, I am a comparative historian, and I'm convinced that there's something about Cuban history that separates it from uh, the histories of other societies in Latin America. And I don't mean to say that other countries have not fought for their independence, that there are no heroes in other countries. I'm not even uh, suggesting that. But I have the opportunity to visit uh, the museum um, in what used to be the Captain's General Palace in Havana, and I entered a room which still gives me the chills. It was a pantheon of all the Cuban heroes who had fought in the wars of independence and died. And they were there in painting. And it was painting after painting after painting after painting after painting. After painting. 30 years of war. Other countries fought for their independence. Some didn't even fight for it. But it wasn't 30 years. And they didn't have to fight 300,000 Spanish at the same time like we did. Nor did they have concentration camps where probably 100,000 Cubans died. And again, I'm not a chauvinist. Well, maybe I am. It is a different history. It is a different history. And the point that I'm trying to make is that it has marked our society. There's this uh, veneration of the man on horseback. Um, we have had many people who are on the other side of the equation who have fought for Cuba's democracy and independence in other ways. Jose Martí is the biggest example. And our history is also very tragic. I love when I go to New York to visit Central Park and see this statue, which I had a, a, an image of it. Yes, I do actually later. Uh, 
Jose Martí, dressed in a three-piece suit with his pen. His, he wasn't wearing glasses. Maybe he didn't wear them. On a horse, on a white horse, being killed on his first day in battle. Hey, that is a metaphor for, uh, I think, the, the Cuban spirit as far as, as, as warfare goes. Uh, and then, of course, that continued. Um, Cuba, and at the end, we see the statue of Jose Martí falling off the horse, dead in, 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 in New York City. But Cuba is a country of men on horseback. Now, I know you live in Panama. There are no such statues there. It's, it's a different culture. Uh, here I have the next slide, which is we've, we've had the misfortune of having far too many dictators, and they made it to Time Magazine. I looked at all the covers of Time Magazine, and there are just a couple of Cubans who made it to the cover who were not dictators. Again, that's uh, part of a, the drama and tragedy of, of our history. The Pendular Revolution. I wanted to get creative with this. And again, this is not a very original contribution, but it is a way of organizing how we look at the Cuban Revolution. So the pendulum actually moves. There's a first stage beginning with January 1st, 1959. You can say that it actually begins earlier than that, up to 1962, of heroic idealism. This is the time of, of, of that idealism characterized by by people like Che Guevara, by Camilo Cienfuegos, Uber Matos. You, you see these pictures from that period in black and white. It's fascinating to see Camilo Cienfuegos with a cowboy hat, uh, Che Guevara with a beret, uh, Fidel Castro with a baseball cap. Um, and, and there was even a picture in Bohemia, I wish I had it, of a, a Cuban freedom fighter uh, who was wearing a top hat, this probably illiterate person was wearing a top hat, which I guess he found, he looted from some wealthy Batistiano's uh, home, and he was very proudly wearing it. Now, I love that image because that is the essence of a revolution. You see? You take, and it reminds me of Napoleon, who was crowning himself. So there's that first stage, and then compromised idealism. See, uh, in this stage, Cubans want to move away from sugar. Um, they want to have a, a very radical revolution that becomes increasingly radical in 60, 61, 62. Um, then we need to keep in mind that Cuba is part of a, of a broader world. And uh, there's an economic crisis late 62, early 63. And Cuba has to go back to the trap of sugar. And part of that decision had to do with the Soviet Union, because the Soviet Union became Cuba's benefactor, but it was a benefactor that also wanted to keep Cuba under control. And one of the ways of doing that was precisely the same thing that had happened before 1959. Well, let's keep you producing sugar and forget about everything else. And manufacturing, uh, foodstuffs, well, just import them from, from us. And then reluctant pragmatism. <clears throat> So we, Cuba begins to swing even further, I would say, to the right. Um, they become closer with the Soviet Union. There is a, a fever to produce 10 million tons of sugar in 1970. The whole economy is uh, directed in, towards, that, towards that goal. It failed. Uh, and in the process, Cuba became even more vulnerable to the Soviet Union. And I'll talk about that in the next slide which is institutionalized pragmatism. So this is a swing further in this direction. You go from idealism to pragmatism. And there are a few characters that I'll mention later that are responsible for these swings. And by that, I mean that, well, we go away from that revolution in, in effervescence completely to something that is very institutionalized. We have five-year plans with the Soviet Union. We have. Uh, a, the institutionalization of the, the units of, of government, a new constitution, a, a new party, and so on. And then there's a swing back, very briefly, from 1986 to the year 1990, when Castro says, enough. 
enough institutionalization, enough part capitalism, now we're going to start a revolution. And those were his words in one speech. Now, how many years after he started? Uh, but it was a very short period. And then the revolution during the special period of profound crisis goes into what I call a survivalist mode. And it's survivalist idealism um, for the whole period. And then survivalist, uh, like, well, that's the one that I should have come up. I'm sorry for that. And then there's a second part, and this is after uh, Fidel Castro left power. And we see that Raul Castro is a far more pragmatic uh, individual. And my thesis is that the pendulum swing has ended. It's very hard for historians to forecast the future, but Cubans have been burned so many times. Oh, let's be idealistic. Oh, now let's be pragmatic. Let's be idealistic, pragmatic. That there's no room for idealism anymore. And we see that in the new generations. They are, they're very pragmatic. They've been burned because of all of these changes. And the last of the, of the, pen, the, the one who swung the pendulum the most was Fidel Castro, who's no longer around. So it's, it's very interesting to see what happens in the next few years. The third man, Guevara, he was part of that first idealistic. He was very radical. He wanted full communism, China style. Um, he was very influential in many of the decisions that were made to create a very egalitarian society during those early idealistic uh, years. Then we see a swing to another second man, which happens around 1965. Guevara uh, is now in contradiction with Fidel Castro. Because Fidel Castro very cunningly sort of played the role of, a, of an arbiter, a false role of an arbiter. And he had his brother Raul and Carlos Rafael Rodriguez to push for something that was more quote unquote reformists. No, we want to be more like the Soviet Union, which is quite the opposite of what Che Guevara wanted. And the Soviet Union was reformist. That is, well, we don't want to be fully communist. There's space for private enterprise. So this was a time of debate, actually called the Great Debate. And Carlos Rafael Rodriguez won. Then many years later, we have um, Carlos Aldana. I'll talk about him briefly. He was the third man for just maybe one or two years. Carlos Laje. So there are three Carlos who are the third man in a row. And then most recently, Ramiro Valdez. And that occurred in around the year 2008. So let's see them. Always Fidel, el numero uno. Raul Castro, el numero dos. And then Guevara. And then that changed uh, around 1965. Again, he had many connections with the Soviet Union. Uh, that was very important at the time. And that was one of the reasons why he became the third man of the revolution. Carlos Aldana had bad timing because he was a reformist. And in a way, that fit well for a while. But as the relationship between Cuba and the Soviet Union were souring and becoming more distant, at a time when Castro was holding on firmly to a, the, the socialist al alternative, he lost uh, his, his importance. It's interesting, he's back, and he may very well be the third man as we speak. Uh, then came Carlos Laje, who was also a reformist, but at this point, Fidel Castro was embracing uh, reformism, allowing for uh, private enterprise, that kind of... Uh, that kind of, of, of reformism. So Carlos Laje became very popular, very important. Uh, the architect of turning the economy around, embracing tourism, all these kinds of things. And then uh, in 2008, once Raul Castro became el numero uno, um, there's a selection of two men, both aging revolutionaries, men on horseback, people who, who were members of that intimate circle uh, from the beginning of, of the revolution. And this is very telling because he chose military men at this juncture. Uh, he chose Ramiro Valdez, who he had antagonized with, but it was a juncture in which Ramiro Valdez provided something that was very important. 
particularly having to do with the control of the internet and something that Ramiro Valdez has called the, the wild pool of technologies. He, he, I think that was part of why he was named the third man. As you know, there's a new vice president. We don't know much about him. Uh, I'm not very optimistic. He's not a man on horseback. Uh, and uh, really, we don't know who's, who's number three at this time. The art of triangulation. Uh, Fidel Castro has been very capable of either creating situations for triangulation or taking advantage of those. And I'm going to go quickly over this. Here we have Batista in power, and there is tensions between two groups of anti-Batista groups. On the one hand, we have the, the Politicos. You see uh, Grau San Martin. On the other hand, you have the armed organizations like Organización Auténtica. And then uh, once the civilian alternative is lost, or the civilianist alternative, there's a triangulation between different groups. And we have the Movimiento 26 de Julio and the Directorio Revolucionario, which were, I mean, they were fighting for the same cause, but there were many, many tensions that, uh, between the leaders of these two groups that, that go back many years ago. And then uh, once the 26 de Julio has become the really the only option standing, there are tensions between the Sierra, those in the highlands, and those in the lowlands. And Castro was taking advantage of this to debilitate this group and to strengthen this group, which was led by Raul Castro and Che Guevara. Now Fidel Castro is in power, and there's another triangulation. And here we have the Partido Socialista Popular, which was a communist party, versus the 26th of July movement, and Castro and Raul and others foster tensions between these two, and guess which one won? Of course, the communists. That, that is a very interesting, it's very interesting how, how that happened um, <coughs> gradually. Then the next triangulation is, well, now the 26th of Julio is out, now we have old communists and Fidelista communists, and the old communists are pushed out gradually. And then this happened during the Great Debate, uh, Fidel Castro sort of saying, well, you know, I, I really don't care, but of course he cared, and there was the triangulation um, of Guevara and the idealists and Carlos Rafael Rodriguez and the more pragmatist uh, communists. Well, I'm not going to give Castro credit for this, but triangulation also happened in the international arena. And at first, we see that you know, Cuba, of course, and even after just a couple of weeks of, of reaching power, Fidel Castro said, if the Yankees send their Marines, we're going to send them back in, in, in coffins. We're going to kill, I forget the exact quote, but 200,000 of them. So from the very beginning, he was antagonizing the United States. <clears throat> but I think the United States had an opportunity to work with him. And that was a moment when the Rubicon was crossed in April 1959. Fidel Castro went to the United States to meet with the president, Eisenhower. Eisenhower decided to play golf that day and sent him, uh, asked uh, Nixon to meet with him. Well, part of the 90 miles is that we haven't understood each other. And frankly, the United States has not understood uh, the, the sense of honor in Cuban culture. And we keep paying the price for that. And so Castro came out angry. He said, to his, one of his colleagues, he said, that, I won't say what he said, spent all of the time scolding me as if I was a little kid. At the same time, Raul Castro was in the Soviet Union. You see how things can be lost because we don't understand culture? And I think we've, we've also missed that opportunity in the last 10 years. And then, of course, when the United States is out, there were increasing tensions between the Soviet Union and China. And again, Cuba used that to its advantage and actually fostering that, um, that. OK, the longest 90 miles. I love this. I like to collect maps. What do you think of that map? Where's Cuba? Well, according to American Airlines, there's no Cuba. And it, it looks funny, right? 
Uh, and it is, I think, a good metaphor of what Cuba is. And Cuba has been a thorn on the side of the United States. Um, Cuba has given this country more headaches than any other country that I can think of. For, for Actually, the aspirin was invented in 1899, which I don't think is a, a coincidence. And um, the, the, the fact that there have been many tensions. The humiliation of Cubans through the Platt Amendment. We never forgave that. You mean that we can be independent only if we give you the key so that you can come into our country and invade when you think we're doing things wrong? No, we're not kids. But we were forced to accept that. Uh, gunboat diplomacy, the interventions in Cuba. That's a Marine urinating on Jose Martí. This is a, that meeting that I talked about. This is a famous painting uh, that depicts the Cuban scientist Finlay. Who discovered the connection between yellow fever and mosquitoes? Every Cuban knows that, Finlay. But there's a different interpretation of that. And actually, this was a painting that was done at a time when a, there was a, one of those quiz shows. And somebody was asked, who discovered that connection? And they said, I forget his name, an American, very famous physician. Walter, Walter, Walter Reed. Reed. Thank you. And, and, and he won the prize. There was an outrage in Cuba. There was an outrage. And I've read the consular paper saying, we need to be careful you know, with these kinds of things. Cubans are very, very uh, attached to this sense of honor. Many Cubans. OK, let's see the. Cuba was divided before the revolution, geographically, racially, by class, in many regards. It was not paradise, and we all know that. Um, Cuba was further divided when, by the hundreds of thousands, many of us had to leave. So now we have a Cuba in, in Florida, particularly Miami, and we have a, a Cuba on the island. But this Cuba on the island is very divided, too, politically and in many regards. The Cuba on the island, in spite of the efforts to present Cuba as a united front, which has never really been, is also divided, and increasingly so. Sugar is back. Hierarchy is back. Okay, I actually never left. And I want to close by, by reading the last section of the book, of the, of the last chapter, I should say, which, as I said, was something that I thought about very recently when I was here in Miami. And I'm going to read it, something that I don't really like to do, but it's called The Blog Heard Around the World. In January 2013, the Cuban government relaxed travel restrictions, making it easier for Cubans on the island to travel abroad and for Cubans abroad to visit the island with fewer limitations. These significant changes responded in great measure to the government's st strategy to increase the flow of hard currency to the island a, a retired septuagenarian, say, from Guanabacoa, works long hours in, at a Hialeah factory over three months and brings back home gifts and a couple of thousand dollars back to Cuba. While even formally hated defectors, like U.S. Major League player Jose Contreras, are warmly welcomed back and are able to contribute to their family's economy. But these changes are also the result of the trenchant transnationalism of hundreds of thousands of anonymous Cubans in and out of the island who for decades have treated the longest 90 miles as if they never existed or were the shortest. One of the most significant ramifications of relaxation of travel regulations has been the ability of Cuban dissidents and bloggers to spread their message around the world. Salient examples of distant travelers are Berta Soler, president of Las Damas de Blanco, Rosa Maria Payá, who continues her crusade to find out the truth about her father's death in a car accident, and bloggers Orlando Pardo Lasso and Giovanni Sanchez, who is indisputably best known, the best known Cuban dissident. Eliezer Avila, who had publicly confronted Alarcón back in 2008 about the right to travel finally got his wish. He arrived in Sweden without a penny, he said, 
When an interviewer asked him whether he intended to stay there, he replied, I reserve the right to live anywhere in the world. But for the moment, Cuba is my life. After having previously been denied a visa to leave Cuba more than 10 times, on the Ides of March 2013, Sanchez boarded a plane bound for New York City, where she began her eight-day tour, which included the United States, Brazil, Mexico, the Netherlands, Spain, and a few other European countries. She spoke at the UN headquarters and met with officials at the White House and the US Congress, spoke at Mexico's Senate and Miami's emotional emotionally symbolic Freedom Tower, and she also spoke at, spoke at FIU, used during the 1960s to process hundreds of thousands of Cuban refugees. Dressed in the simple style of a 1960s folk singer, her black waist-long mane cascading forward over her left shoulder, and an ever-present smile on her first keen face, 37-year-old Sanchez spoke softly but firmly wherever she went, never losing her calm demeanor, even as some angry pro-Castro protesters booed and bombarded her with epithets and insults. CIA agent, mercenary, traitor. In Brazil, a woman pulled her hair. In Mexico, another one interrupted and shoved in her face fake CIA dollar bills. Undaunted by those disruptions, Sanchez carried on. Armed with a microphone, loaded with her impeccable mastery of the Spanish language. She conveyed information about the enduring repression and sordid realities of her communist homeland. She expressed a desire for a free, unified Cuban nation and emphasized the need to put an end to that, quote, fossil from the Cold War, meaning the embargo. While repudiated and booed by some, Sanchez was welcomed and cheered by many more. Nowhere more effusively than in Miami, where part of her family resides. In her Miami speaking engagements, in an interview, she stressed the need for the many Cubas to unify and join a common cause for a democratic, independent, and prosperous fatherland. Her mere presence demonstrated the possibility of unity even among rival exiled groups, who for decades have been divided by triangulation schemes, the embargo among them, conceived and manipulated from Washington, Havana, and Miami. As highlighted by the Miami Herald editorial, Sanchez was admired and jointly welcomed by exile organizations as disparate as the uh, 2056 Brigade, Bay of Pic Be veterans, composed of long dismounted men on horseback, the hardline pro-embargo Cuba Liberty Council, Right of Center Canaf, which supports the embargo, but also the easing of restrictions in travel and remittances by Cubans in the US, and the centrist Cuba study group, which opposes the embargo. While speaking at an event hosted by Miami-Dade College at the Freedom Tower, Sanchez shared an anecdote about a casual encounter that she had with a German national who upon learning that she was Cuban, asked her whether she was from Fidel's Cuba or Miami's Cuba. With her characteristic wit, grace, and respect, even for the most absurd questions, Sanchez replied, Chico, I am I am Jose Martí Cuban. Thank you. <laughs>